Hey y'all, welcome to Fountain City Church's weekly sermon. Here at Fountain City, we believe in multiplying families of missional disciples, both locally and globally. And we really hope that this sermon encourages you to do the same. If you live in the area, make sure to join us on a Sunday. Thanks for watching. All right. We are in a series through Christmas week called Journey to the King, and we're reflecting on the journey that every single one of us is on as we grow in the Lord. You know, three times a year, we talked about this last week, three times a year, the entire nation of Israel was commanded to leave their homes, pack up their stuff, get all their gear together, and travel to the city of Jerusalem to worship God. And when they got there, they would give tithes and free will offerings, and they would celebrate in God's presence for all his faithfulness over that year. And as we're in this series, what we want to do is we want to learn from Israel how to stop and to remember who God is and who we are because of him. And so as we move toward Thanksgiving and Christmas, we actually just want to slow down and we want to fix our eyes on Jesus as a community. And to do that, we are going through some of the songs of ascent. These are Psalm chapter uh, 120 through 135. And this was kind of like the soundtrack for the nation of Israel as they went up to the temple. They would sing these psalms and they would quote these as poems and as scripture and they would pray and they would get their hearts centered back on who God is. And so this morning, we're jumping back into that soundtrack. We'll be in Psalm 123 as we continue the series. All right. I lift up my eyes to you, to you who sit enthroned in heaven. As the eyes of slaves look to the hand of their master, as the eyes of a female slave look to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God till he shows us his mercy. Have mercy on us, Lord. Have mercy on us, for we have endured no end of contempt. We have endured no end of ridicule from the arrogant, of contempt from the proud. Father, would you just be with us in our time this morning? Would you speak by your word and Holy Spirit, you are welcome here to do as you see fit. Lord, no matter what we're teaching, if you want to go left and I've got right plan, Father, we go left. And so I just ask you to give us clarity and wisdom to hear your voice and discernment about what it is that you're up to today. We thank you, Lord. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. And so we stand in that freedom this morning. And Lord, we pray that you would speak your words to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, the Songs of Ascent have this unique way of using this journey toward the temple for the nation of Israel. And for us, our journey toward the Lord and toward growing in Him And the the songs of ascent have this way of showing us how we tend to deal with trouble that comes. In, In Psalm 121, last week, the psalmist showed us that when we go through these times of testing, our hearts actually go into this posture of searching to anything and anyone who can help us. And I don't know if you remember that. He says, I lift up my eyes to the hills. And for many of us, we think that's like a very spiritual good thing. But the psalmist says, that's a bad thing. I'm looking to the hills for any idol worship, any pagan God who can satisfy the longings of my soul. And the psalmist taught us last week that we are to look to the Lord our God who is our helper. Amen? So our tendency often is for our eyes to just start darting to and fro. I don't know if you're like that. You hit a moment of anxiety or tension or weariness and suddenly you feel this like anxiety that's leading the way in searching for an answer. And I will look to all sorts of things to fill that that craving. But the psalmist this week tells us in Psalm 123 that one of the other tendencies we have in seasons of hardship and testing is to give up. He says, just like in Psalm 121, the guy is scouring the hillsides looking for help. In Psalm 123, we start with a person whose head is down. They have tapped out. They have given up. Hardship has come. Things got crazy. And what they were left with was anxiety and depression and hopelessness. His head is down. His eyes may be closed. And he has no hope or reason to look up. Years ago, it was probably 20 years ago now, I went to Africa with a team of people who were working with Teen Challenge. And we traveled into uh, Swaziland. It's just north of South Africa. It's called Eswatini now. 
And we were in this hospital that was for children. And from the outside of it, this is a building that was so dilapidated, it would have been completely thrown away in our culture. No one would have used it as a a public building. But for them, it was a hospital. And as we toured the inside of this hospital, there were hundreds of children who were burned from head to toe. And we were slowly being taken through, and the doctors were describing what it was that these kids had gone through, the atrocities, the things that had led them to this moment. And as terrifying as the sight of these children was who had suffered such severe burns, the most terrifying thing in that place was the silence. And I remember turning to the doctor and saying, you got to help me understand. How were all of these hundreds of kids burned head to toe and yet they don't cry out? And he said something that will never leave me. Why cry when there's no hope? Proverbs 18, 14 says, The human spirit can endure in sickness, but a crushed spirit, who can bear? And and for many of us, when we look at Psalm 123, we think about like a Saturday morning, coffee in hand, quiet time with the Lord. And he says, the picture of this is wildly different. The picture is a little closer to our own experience, to our own hardship, in moments where we face uh, trial and suffering and testing Life has a way of forcing your head down and emptying your heart of hope. But the psalmist tells us, I lift up my eyes to you, Lord. In the midst of this press against hope, in the the midst of this pain that can force us into moments of hopelessness, some of you may be here this morning, the psalmist tells us, in those moments, I have to lift the burden up and I lift my eyes to you. That, that word for lift is not just I pick up my eyes as though it's simple. It, it is like someone who is lifting a burden that is almost too heavy to push. And I don't know if you've been in a moment like that where it's like, I know, I know that God is good and I know that he is faithful, but it is taking me exerting this deep faith, this residing hope that God in fact will see and will hear and will respond. I lift my eyes. It's like I'm having to push up a metal ceiling. I lift them to you, Lord. And some of you are here this morning and you feel like you are under the weight of this steel thing sitting on you. And God says, lift your eyes. Lift them. Because for all of us, there is this temptation, this corrosive temptation to slide into despair and hopelessness. And while nobody is going to throw a stone at you for going through a hard time and being hopeless, no one can lift your eyes for you. You, you, there, there is something in us that we have to be moved to lift our own eyes, to strengthen ourselves in the Lord. He says, lift up your eyes. I was thinking about uh, this song. How many of you know that song, It Is Well With My Soul? Yeah. It was written by this man named Horatio Spafford. If you've ever read the backstory for like this song in this guy's life, In 1871, Horatio Spafford and his wife Anna were moving. They were actually going from the U.S. and going over to the U.K. And he had some work that was delaying him. And so he actually stayed in the U.S. several weeks and he was going to follow his wife and their four daughters. Years before that, his son had died of scarlet fever. Tragic, 1871. And then in 1874, they boarded the ship. Horatio stayed in the U.S. as his wife and daughters traveled over to the UK, but somewhere along the way they hit an iceberg and the ship begins to sink. And the story goes that his wife and his four daughters climb onto the, the, board, the, the front part of the ship, kneel down before the Lord and say, Lord, would you save us if it be in your will? All four daughters passed, but Horatio's wife lived. And it was out of that tragedy His wife messages him from across the the ocean and says, all have died, I alone survived, what to do? And Horatio, in response, boards a ship and he crosses over this channel. And as he gets to the place where the ship went down, the captain says, sir, this is where your daughter's passed. And he penned the words in that moment. When peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, Whatever in life thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Do you see the background, the backstory of hardship in which God produces hope? 
a hope that extends beyond just a temporary moment into something that is deeper. It, it reminds me of Paul's words, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Right? We put it on bumper stickers and on t-shirts and we forget that the context of that passage is prison. Anybody know that? He says, whether I have plenty or I have little, I have learned the secret of contentment. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We have a persevering faith that is full of hope, full of the life of God, and yet it is often played out in places and in moments and in circumstances not a single one of us would choose. In moments and places and circumstances that if we were to describe them to someone else, they would think that is hopeless. But with this God, there is hope. There's hope. The psalmist writes that if we lift our eyes to the Lord, we will discover something beautiful. That God is not anxiously pacing the floor and wringing his hands. If I can get my eyes up, I recognize that there is a God who is in heaven and that we get to encounter his presence. And what is he doing? He is seated on a throne in glory. I remember as a teenage boy, we would come home sometimes, and inevitably, uh, Evan and I, my brother, we would come home late, Evan especially. Evan was really good at coming home late. And my dad, if we came through the front door, my dad had a recliner that was straight through the dining room into the living room, and he would recline and sit there and watch that door. You get the image. He wasn't pacing, wringing his hands. Maybe that happened. We weren't there. He, he wasn't nervously like walking and calling the police. He was waiting. And the second, uh, this is great. Evan thought he got away with it one night and he came in darkness. And my dad is sitting in the chair, washing the door. <laughs> dad is on the throne. And when dad is on the throne, I can look no matter what I'm going through. And I see, oh, if he's not nervous, I have permission also to be at peace. Dad's on the throne. And and here in this moment, we find this glimpse of what the Father is doing in heaven. Not not wringing his hands, not walking around wildly. He is seated. He, He is at peace. He is relaxed. Dallas Willard was once asked, if you could describe God in one word, what word would it be? And he said, relaxed. Is that what you think of when you think of God? In the moments where everything is shaken, it's chaotic, you look to him and he's just, he's relaxed. And if the God who is on the throne of heaven is relaxed and my life belongs to him and he lives in me and I live in him, I have permission to be relaxed. Now that takes quite a bit of work for me. Anybody else? Some of you are hardwired to be anxious. You, You have an invitation You have the inheritance of someone who can live in the place of relaxed because of this invitation of the God who is with you. Now, why is this important for us that God is seated on this throne in heaven? Because when life has forced our heads down, here's what we need. We need two things, Lindy. We need someone who is strong enough to lead us where we can't lead ourselves. And secondly, we need someone who is gentle enough to empathize with us in our pain. I need both. I need someone who knows where I've been, who who can show me where I'm going. I don't need someone who can just coddle me and talk to me about my all my problems. That's great, but I don't want to live there. How many of you want to just move on from the pain? Some of you want to set up camp. You want to set up a like life there. Get out of there. It's killing you. It's killing everybody else too, by the way. No, I I need someone who is gentle enough to love me where I'm at and is strong enough to lead me where I can't get. Hebrews 4.14 says, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Hear that. You do not have a high priest who commands you where to go without understanding what you go through. You do not have a high priest who is detached and disconnected from your human experience, but you have one who came down the mountain, who went through everything the same way that you have, who put on flesh and blood and weakness and frailty and suffering and betrayal and oppression and was faithful. 
We do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are. Yet he did not sin. Folks, Jesus is strong. Jesus is strong. I don't know what paintings you're looking at, at the meek and mild Jesus wearing a white robe with blonde hair who looks like a stiff wind could blow him over. (laughs) Jesus is strong, and I'm not just talking about physically strong. I am talking about this reality that Jesus ascended where no one could That God himself invited this Jesus to fulfill Daniel 7 and to come into heaven to be seated at his right hand. And from that place of strength, he leads and governs your life. He leads and oversees and overshadows your life. He is mighty. You need someone who can lead you where you can't get by yourself. Right? And the psalmist says, in a moment where I look up and I'm hopeless to get where I need to go, there is a God who is in heaven who sees you and he knows you and he knows how to get you where you need to be. And secondly, he is gentle. He walked 33 years in your flesh. He suffered under temptation. He felt the sting of loss and betrayal. And so he knows how to empathize with me. Not not detached Not removed from my reality, but as God of gods who truly knows what you go through. Sometimes it is difficult for me to wrap my mind around that. That the the God who created heaven and earth also came and lived in a a body that was failing. It, It was weak. That God limited himself in that way. Matthew 11, 28 through 30 tells us, That because of that, Jesus can say to us, hey, you can come to me when you're weary and burdened. I can give you rest. There is no other human who can give me rest. There's no other entity who can give me rest. Only the God who is strong and gentle can give me that kind of rest. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Folks, the first thing that we encounter when we lift our eyes up is not some divine experience detached from a person. We experience Him. We experience the same Jesus who walked in our flesh and was resurrected and seated at the right hand of the Father. You have this invitation on a Sunday morning when we're worshiping after the service today when we spend time in response to lift your eyes up and to find His face. You've been given an invitation. You yourself can experience the living God. This is, this is nothing that anyone in creation has been able to do except in our experience as sons and daughters of God in Christianity. That you get to face-to-face experience God without being killed. Do you understand? Like, like the revelation of Hebrews, it says that God is a consuming fire. Revelation and Ezekiel picture him as light from the waist up and glowing metal from the waist down. Like terrifying. Yeah. Terrifying. Every person who ever encountered an angel who was sent from God fell on their face and said, I'm dead. Yeah. Yeah. And he says... Because of your faith, you can come boldly before my throne. What? The same God? The same consuming fire? The same holy God? I I can come before him like that? Yeah. And the first invitation when we begin to lift our eyes, lift the burden of that hopelessness and search for his face is that we find him. He makes himself findable. It's one of my favorite passages in Jeremiah. When he says, if, if, if you seek me, I will be found by you. So it's passive. He says, I'm like the dad who plays hide and go seek with their kid and stands in plain sight. <laughs> Come find daddy, you know. <clears throat> you know who you are. When, when you first start, like Bryce has got a baby. Some of you got little kids. Maybe they're, they're just in toddling phase. When you have a toddler, you don't like really hide, right? Like what if you played hide and seek and you hid under the house? Like, you're a terrible dad if you do that with your toddler. <laughs> I'm going to beat this kid. They're not going to get me this time, you know. <laughs> no, you, you say, hey, come find daddy. And then you just stand behind the skinniest tree like this, you know, gut and rear hanging out. <laughs> come find daddy. It's not impossible. God makes himself findable. 
For those who are looking for him, you will find him. He says, when you seek me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Are you seeking him with all of your heart? I will make myself findable. When I look to him, I find his face. This is the first thing that we see. He is gentle and he's humble in heart. He's mighty to save. He is worth looking for. He is worth looking for. This morning, you're looking for hope. He is worth looking for. He is the one you long for. And he is seated on the throne. What does God's throne have to say to us? In Psalm 89, 14, it says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. When I hear about the throne of God, this is not some, uh, you know, pastel colored painting with chubby cherubs on it. That is not what the throne of God ought to elicit in us as his people. It is this vision of the rule and the reign of God who is father. And the throne of God from Psalm 89, 14 says that we have access to God's righteousness, his rightness in a world filled with wrongness and everything going sideways and upside down. There is a God who rules my life, who sits in rightness. He is perfect and holy. You're like, Grant, crap is upside down. Stuff is happening in my life that I can't seem to get cleaned up. And there is this promise through the throne of God that one day all things will be made right because God is righteous and he is also just. How many of you are struggling? Maybe even this morning, I have situations in my life where I'm going, God, there are some things that are unjust. There's some things that have not gone the way that I believe you think they ought to go. How do I reconcile serving a God who is righteous and just and things going in a way that are unjust? It is that one day the promise is that everything, everything, not some things, not a few things, all of the things will be made right and they will be reconciled in justice. And when I see his throne... I recognize that no matter where I'm at on the journey with Jesus, no matter how far I feel from his presence or from nearness, that God sovereignly watches over my life. And if he is on the throne, there is this revelation that I am not. When I see the throne of God, I am confronted face to face with the reality that I do not control my own life. I don't call the shots. As much as I believe I know how God ought to respond to things, I simply don't control it. And yet, I am called to lift up my eyes. And when I see him, I recognize he is on the throne. There there is one who is the most high, and it is not me. And it is not you, and it is not culture around us, and it is not anybody else. There is one. He is high and lifted up. In Psalm 11, chapter 4, it says, The Lord is in His holy temple. The Lord is on His heavenly throne. Dad's in the chair. He observes everyone on earth. His eyes examine them. When when I look at His throne, this is what it tells me, Gabriel. It tells me that God's eyes are examining me from this place of relaxation and rule. Now, here's why that's really important. Because in difficult seasons, it is so tempting to believe that God is good, but for other people. And that God is sovereign, but for other people. And that God is in control, but for other people. And what I recognize very quickly, when I'm faced with the throne of God, every time I look to him, he seems somehow to look only back at me. Now, I know that that's not true. He's looking at all of us. But it seems to me that he's just examining me. We have this confidence that God is looking at us, that we don't go through things alone. His word says his eyes never depart from the righteous. As we said last week, he doesn't blink. He's always looking at you. He is worth lifting your eyes to see. Friends, he is worth looking at this morning. And in this season where things seem to speed up and move at breakneck speed, can I just urge you to slow down? And to lift up your eyes. Next, the psalmist says that we do this in a very specific posture. I don't just look at God like I'm his peer or his buddy. He says, as the eyes of a slave look to the hand of his master, so our eyes look to the Lord our God. How do we come to God? 
He gives us this radical access, this promise of his presence. He gives us the, the, the swipe card at the hotel to get into the inner rooms, like whatever we need. I don't know if you guys are like this. When I go to hotels and I see those little swipe things, I want to get into all of them. I'm swiping everything I can. Gym, cafeteria, like wherever, where are the goodies? What does this card get me into? God has given you access by his presence, by his blood to come into every door. And this is one of the revelations that we have in Christ, is that we have this incredible access. But what is my posture when I get before him? What is it like? If I have this wild access to come before him, how do I relate to him? David Gutzik writes that the example pictures a waiter or a butler standing behind his master seated at dinner. The servant looks to the hand of his master for the slightest indication of need or want to instantly meet the need. With that same intensity, devotion, and steadfastness, the psalmist looks to God. You know, the difference between a a servant at a restaurant, I'm sorry, a server at a restaurant and a servant of a king, is that the server comes and goes to serve other patrons. They're busy just kind of like exercising their own agenda. We've got 15 other patrons. i got to make sure I'm giving attentiveness to all these people. But a slave at the hand of his master has one purpose. One purpose. And the posture God invites us into is to see this one purpose that we hold. It's not that we can't do other things. It's that God invites us into this revelation of what it means to relate to him as a good master who oversees his servants. But our eyes are attentively fixed on his hands. To sit perfectly still in the presence of the king. To watch every move, to wait on his needs, to anticipate the king's desire. That is the work that we have. My friend Curtis Dolman, who pastors at Praise Ministry Tabernacle across the river, he calls it staring contest. The place of prayer, the the place of prayer is really just a staring contest. I sit and stare at him until he moves, and then I do what he does. Do you have that relationship to the Father? One of the things that can rob us of that is that hopelessness and that anxiety that builds when junk is going on in your life. We quickly move to just get control and security, you know? Like I'm surrounded with this depiction all the time as a, as a father of a, a teenage girl. God bless you, Lily. Okay. It's easy to see in our kids what I, I'm a little blind to see in myself. But in moments of anxiety, often we will wrestle out, we'll search for control, we'll search for things that give us hope and stability, even in moments where we're we're choosing to overlook God himself. I I will double down and work a lot harder, because I think if I can just make enough money, this anxiety I'm dealing with will go away. I will just watch another Netflix show, because obviously if I entertain myself to death, that feeling of hopelessness will dissipate. How's it going for you? I will fill myself up. I will go on more vacations because we think if I have some transcendent experience with a beautiful place in Europe, that somehow it is going to meet the deep needs of my soul. And then you hit the plane ride back and you realize, oh, there is this actual world I have to enter back into. I don't know if any of you have gone through YWAM. It was one of the things I've experienced with kids coming back from YWAM. You go on radical mission to save the world, and then you come back into daily life and you drown. You can't make sense of your faith anymore. How do we reconcile this thing? We need eyes that are attentive to one thing. Eyes that are attentive to one thing. This this invitation to sit perfectly still and to watch and wait on the Lord. And I just wonder, like, in this holiday season, moving into this part of the year where things seem to speed up so quickly, what would it look like for us to cultivate that kind of attentiveness? You feel it. Yesterday was funny. I I finished my message on Friday, which y'all don't know, this is a miracle, okay? It's a miracle of God. And yesterday, I sat with time off, and I felt just anxious, like a caged animal. It's like, ooh, what do I, something's wrong. I got to work this out, Lord. I got time on my hands, and I don't know how to use it in a way that's life-giving and with you. Oof. What would it look like for us to cultivate the kind of attentiveness to the Lord where we sense the slightest twitch of his hand? 
where my eyes, my heart are fixed. God, what are you doing? What are you up to today? What's the thing that's on your heart that when I slow myself, when I get into your presence, I can't help but to discover that this is the thing that you're working on. He says, like the eyes of a slave looks to the hand of his master. Not fearful. He's not propping up slavery here. He's, he's saying that we, we are training ourselves for how to honor and adore the Lord in his presence. We're completely submitted and surrendered. We're completely humble before him. Our eyes are fixed on him. Many of you, you're in a season where your eyes need to be fixed on the Lord. And I, I don't think that's actually a season now that I say that. that that's a lifestyle. What does it look like for you at work and in your family in moments around the holiday table when things get hectic and stressed? How do you keep your eyes fixed on him? That's the question we're asking. We don't serve a brutal master, y'all. We're we're the servants and co-heirs with Christ. We are those who have been purchased and healed and restored and set free from the Holy Spirit. And so how are we to watch him? With hearts that long to do whatever he ser- whatever serves him and whatever serves his purposes. A heart of gratitude. How many of you are doing that in this season? Like I, one of the things that I think is really encouraging for us in those moments where I can't seem to find him is to slow down and give thanks for the places where I have seen him work. You know, there's like a really great practice of just having a gratitude journal. Or just taking time every day on your notes app and your phone and just saying, hey, I'm really thankful today. I have lungs that work. I have legs that work. My body functions today. My mind functions. Are you with me? Yeah. You ever just stop and think about the trillion of, of medical miracles happening in your body right now? We look around us and we see sickness and we think that is the abnormality. You are a walking miracle. There are all these processes firing off in you right now. There is something about taking an account and giving gratitude for what it is that God's done in us. So are you grateful? Are you returning thanks to Him? And notice the psalmist's focus is on the Master's hand. Now this is interesting. We often talk about the Lord's face. Moses said, Lord, show me your face. But the psalmist says, I watch His hands. His hands have to do with the goodness of the Lord rehearsing the goodness of the Lord, the things that he's done in your life. We were, this Wednesday night, we were in a moment of just praise and celebration, and we just opened the floor up for people to share quick testimonies. And there were two testimonies of healing, and there were places where God is transforming people's lives. I could tell you testimonies in this room and in others of people's lives being forever changed, or on the streets of Prague, how this man's arm was radically healed in front of us, and he pulled his cast off. On that same trip where a lady got up out of her wheelchair and pushed her own wheelchair away after we prayed for her. What? These weren't like believers. These were people who didn't know Christ and had an encounter with the Lord in the street and pushed her own wheelchair away. We have to remind ourselves of God's goodness. You you need to remind yourselves of God's goodness. Is everybody with me? I know it's Sunday morning and we're in the Bible Belt. Are you you guys okay? We have to remind ourselves. We have to fight for that, not to just phone our faith in, not to just check the boxes, but to really take time and say, Lord, you have been faithful here. You have heard me and you have responded over and over again in my life. Friends, it's the hands of Jesus washing your feet and it's his hands holding your wounded heart and his hands embracing you and multiplying your food and his hands on you to heal you. The psalmist says, look to his hands. And this morning, perhaps you've lost sight of his hands. You've thought about his heart. God loves me, I know. But you have lost sight of what he's actually doing in you. At times, in seasons where it's difficult, we get so locked in on what's not happening, we forget to talk about what is. And I just want to encourage us as a church family in this season to get loud and vocal about the places where God is at work. What is he doing? That's the definition of faith. How how can we participate in what you are doing, Lord? Not just focus on what you're not doing. How do we get busy working where you are working? Charles Spurgeon says that the picture of the servants looking to the hands of the master suggests these three different things. Number one, dependence. That the hands of the master provide all that's needed. Secondly, submission. That the hands of the master direct the servant's work. And third, it's discipline. The hands of the master correct the servant. 
Can you see his hands today? Can you see his hands in your own life? Where has he been dependable in your life? Where is he calling you to this place of obedience where he directs your work and he shows you that he's with you? Where has he disciplined you? Where has he corrected you? Sometimes that is the greatest revelation is that God has been faithful not to leave me alone to my own mess. He will correct me and keep me on the right track. He's with you. He's with you. Can you see his hands? I remember years back, um, Chrissy's dad passed away three years ago. Um, around this time, October the 14th. And during that time, right after he had brain surgery, there was this this season of weeks where he wasn't fully aware of what his body was doing. And the way that we would love him is to sit by his bed and watch his every movement. Some of you have been in caretaking mode with parents or grandparents or even with kids. You know, when you got this fresh baby and they got those razor sharp fingernails and just like to tear their skin. Like you got to be attentive And there's something about just waiting and watching and doing this slow work. You know, Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits and in his word I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Listen to the cry of the psalmist. My whole being waits. How many of you like to wait? Come on. This is a hand raiser. How many of you just love waiting? You get to the grocery store and there are 33 people in the Walmart line and you think, God, thank you for this opportunity to wait. I thank you that you love me so much. You have gifted me with 33 of the most cantankerous, violent people in the city to all purchase crap we don't need. You have gifted me to wait. No, we hate waiting. We will look for every opportunity to not wait. Our phone service actually has an opportunity right now for you to call in somewhere and then to leave your number and hang up so that they will call you back because we couldn't possibly wait. If I just sat here this morning and slowed down my sentence long enough to give dramatic effect, some of you start crawling in your own skin. I love watching it. I do it sometimes just for my own fun. I just want to teach you how to wait. See, Tori was so upset right then. Y'all just couldn't see her face. The psalmist says, my whole being, my whole being waits. How good are you at just waiting on him? I, I have a black belt in moving ahead of God. And it yields the same fruit every time. It's disaster. Every single time. The psalmist says, like a watchman who's standing on the wall, whose one job it is to look to the horizon and to watch for the enemy coming through watches of the night. Their eye is peeled. They stay fixed, transfixed on this one thing. Waiting. Waiting. Waiting is tough, man. We are just servants watching the hand of the master, not the other way around. We're not asking him to just watch our hands. Hey, God, come and bless what we do. Hey, God, wait on us. Wait on us. We've got some great ideas about our lives. I think God sits back and just kind of chuckles at us. Oh, sweet children. (laughs) Run as much as you want. But we have to learn the lesson that our eyes are to be fixed on him. I'm the servant. I'm not the one that calls the shots. God's not waiting hand and foot on me. I I wait on him. I am the one who's straining to lift my eyes. I am the one with my head down, not him. But when I lift my eyes, every time I find the presence of him who sits enthroned. And if this idea of watching and waiting for the Lord just makes you feel a little anxious this morning, maybe you don't have any space in your day that you leave empty on purpose. Can I encourage you that maybe one of the best habits for us in this season is to practice Sabbath and silence and solitude. Like these are just two practices that have always been in the life of the church. Look for space and strategically leave it empty. Some of y'all do not believe what I'm saying right now. Don't overschedule yourself in this season. 
Leave your phone off for a couple of hours every day and let your brain breathe. Are you with me? Become human again. Not just this cog in a wheel that's turning faster and faster and faster. What does it look like for you to wait on the Lord for Sabbath, to find a day where you don't work? Gentlemen, working seven days a week is not holy. It's sin. I actually think it'll crush you. I don't know if it's sin. Maybe I should take that back. <laughs> in the Old Testament, it certainly was sin. But Jesus himself is our Sabbath. But can I, can I teach you something? If, if we are constantly trying to fill every gap of space in our day, in our week, in our month, in our year, we actually lose the capacity to wait on the Lord. Some of us are unformed and immature in our faith, not because we're making sinful decisions. We're just too busy. You literally can just be too busy to grow in Christ. And that's just a really inconvenient reality for all of us. Isaiah 40, 31 says that they that wait upon the Lord will renew their strength. Do you see the reward in it? If I learn to wait, if I trust that God will fill me, he will actually renew me in that place. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary and walk and not be faint. Waiting comes with reward. There's purpose in it. And finally, he says, when we learn to wait on him, when I learn to lift up my eyes and to find his face, what I discover, the anticipation of my heart, is mercy. I will wait on the Lord until he shows me his mercy. That word for mercy, um, it also means grace or favor or pity. God, I'm looking to you for the thing that I need most right now. I'm looking to you for the thing that I long for most right now. As I look to you, my eager expectation is that you are indeed, like Psalm 121 says, you're my helper. You are the one who can solve and fix the, the, the situations in my life. You are the solution to the circumstance that I'm going through. God, would you come and give me grace? In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, we read it earlier. I want to read verse 16 that goes with it. He says, since we have this great high priest who ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. So let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence to, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. The eager anticipation you have as a son or daughter of God is that when you lift your eyes and when you look to him who is seated, what you will find is grace and mercy and all that you need. How many of you are in that position today? You're like, man, I need it. I need to turn to him and find something. He is looking after you and he's waiting for you to lift up your eyes. This morning, uh, just as we close, I just want to invite us to take some time and to wait on him. I can feel it even here this morning. I feel like there's a sense of like uh, agitation at waiting. Anxiousness. We just got to move on. This is just another thing on the radar, Grant. And can I encourage you? Like Jesus said to Martha, Mary has chosen the better thing. And this morning and in this season that we would learn to choose the better thing. To fix our eyes on him and to remember that he is the one that comes and meets us and satisfies our deepest needs. Why don't you stand to your feet? Hey, thanks again for listening to this week's sermon. If you felt like the Lord was speaking to you in a specific way, please reach out to us at info at We'd love to partner with you in your faith. Thanks again.